we want to talk about the important, you know, the important stuff that's happening today. And what's happening today is literally what's been happening for the past decade. And that gives you an idea of what's what the future holds from the perspective of privacy compliance, privacy enforcement, and the way organizations are adopting uh, privacy policies internally. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to go around the table and introduce our speakers. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, to say that this presentation is made under the auspices of the <clears throat> Knowledge Flow Cyber Safety Foundation. It's a uh, it's a nonprofit foundation that mostly deals with with uh, with protecting um, vulnerable sectors like children and and seniors and so on from from different types of cyber threats. So. Um, Insofar as this is the hosting organization, I'll be moderating this panel today. And we've got three awesome speakers, panelists uh, that you can see here on the panel. So I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll ask our four guests and Amalia, who uh, is my uh, associate at MPC at Managed Privacy Canada to introduce themselves. And we'll go, we'll go backwards from the image that you see on screen. So Derek, I wonder if you could give us a one minute intro, just pretend that you're stuck with us in the elevator for one minute and, and let us know who you are and, and what awesome stuff you're doing within the field of privacy. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Derek Lackey and I'm uh, two roles. I'm the managing director of Newport Thompson, and we help uh, organizations implement privacy management programs. Uh, but I'm also the chairman of the Response Marketing Association, and I um, I entered the privacy world from marketing. So my entire background is marketing. I owned my own ad agency in the '90s, and I've lived my entire life in the marketing community. So I come at privacy from a marketing point of view, and I'm, I'm really more interested in what do I need to do as a marketer than I am uh, arguing the legal nuances. Um, and I realize that somebody has to argue the legal nuances, but that's not me. So I'm far more interested in the implementation of new practices in an organization that makes you compliant. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. And, and for those who don't know Derek, he's also got very deep domain experience within CASEL and lots of interest within uh, Canada's anti-spam law. Um, Constantine. So hi, everyone. Um, I am um, been in privacy for a number of years now in a number of different roles. I am counsel at Innovation, uh, which is a boutique privacy law firm based in Ottawa and Toronto. Um, prior to that, I have been uh, in consulting at a couple of different organizations. I have been a chief privacy officer in two multinationals um, and I've been doing privacy for about 19 years, um, dealing with multinational privacy issues as well as Canadian. Um, and so my um, engagement or involvement with clients is helping them to build privacy programs. I worry about the legal nuances. Um, and also dealing with all the other stuff, which could be, you know, dealing with incidents, helping to support, you know, doing privacy impact assessments, but a big part of what I'm doing lately, and it'll color the comments I make later, is around supporting uh, contract with uh, you know, clients um, now having to deal with privacy obligations expressed by a contract. Excellent. And, and I think the, the key word there is nuances. So Constantine certainly has the depth that, uh, that we seek on this panel. And, and in the interest of full disclosure, Constantine and Amalia have been my colleagues as we've, uh, we've lectured on privacy uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, but um, a great friend of ours is Vance. Vance, would you mind giving us uh, an elevator intro? Speech. Sure. So I'm Vance Lockton. Um, I'm currently a senior technology and policy analyst for the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. Um, I'm not representing them today. I'm just kind of, as Claudio was saying, just kind of having a lunch hour chat with some folks. Right. Um, uh, 
for that, I, so I, I spent a good amount of time with the, the Federal Privacy Commissioner's Office as well. Um, I was with Waterfront Toronto trying to sort out a digital governance framework for their proposed project with, um, with Sidewalk Labs a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah, I've done some consulting and contract work here and there. I, I held the pen on the, the Federal Privacy Commissioner uh, response to C11, that 70 page nightmare that may or may not have killed C11. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Awesome. Thank you, Vance. Um, again, uh, my connection with Vance goes back uh, probably well over a decade. We, we started at the IPC. We, we started at the provincial level, followed him to the federal level. We're back to the provincial level. So um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to keep in touch. And uh, certainly Amalia, uh, who is my partner in Manage Privacy Canada, only because we have so many ideas for doing great things within privacy that we thought this is the best way for us together to work together. And Amalia has a lot to say, but just give us that elevator uh, intro about yourself, Amalia, please. Sure, just very quickly, I'm a privacy professional. Um, I also teach courses and I created the Privacy uh, Management and the Digital Enterprise Certificate with my colleagues, Konstantin, Claudia, and a few other people here. Um, uh, by way of background, I started in IT and then I accumulated uh, audit, risk management, security, all of those interesting things, project management and so on. And currently at Managed Privacy Canada, we work with clients to establish their privacy programs and a system with anything new, like such as today's webinar. Uh, just a, a little anecdote here. Uh, I've known Vance in when we were taking our CIPP exam together. <laughs> Not going to say how long. That's where I met him. And Constantine was my teacher before I took my CIPM. So there you go. Small world. It, it certainly is a small industry. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and I certainly enjoy it. I, I, I encourage everyone in attendance to look up our great panel and connect with them um uh, they're they they're all full of, full of wisdom and information we'll try to extract some of that for our recorded seminar today which will go online uh soon but i want to give you the the overall idea because we want everyone to to leave today's session with with key uh key elements and and you want to have a lunch and learn um or at least a learn <laughs> Um, in, a, in a structured way. The way we structured this is in those three parts. First of all, the state of privacy and how we got here. So generally, uh, a brief discussion on the past decade and what brought us to, to this point. What were, what were some of those pivotal moments in the past uh, decade? Then we'll talk about the current situation, what companies are doing today to comply with privacy regulations. And then we'll talk about a uh, third section that we call a steady state, towards a steady state. What will it take for organizations to prepare for the future? And what can they do today from the perspective of adopting um, uh, privacy policies and practices that will make them, if not bulletproof, at least a little bit more resilient in the face of changing legislation? So without further ado, uh, let's let's see if we can go through the uh, over our panel in no particular order uh, and describe the most pivotal moments of the past decade and certainly those that led us to where we are uh, today. So maybe I can pick on on Vance. Um, Vance, what what are some of those pivotal moments uh, of the past few years? Sure. So I'm I'm. I, I'm appreciating that you've given us that decade timeline um, because it just still kind of fits in this um, the, the 2012 getting accountability right um, paper that the federal office, um, Alberta and, and BC kind of joint, jointly created. So um, I was having a discussion with some folks from the UK, um, from the UK ICO the other day, um, just about another another project entirely. And, you know, we were discussing what, you know, what kind of things should be in it. And we got to uh, accountability and they kind of just threw out this idea that, um, oh, accountability. That, I mean, you're from Canada. That's the home of accountability. I got like, it's kind of interesting that that's, you know, 
the global perspective here is is that you know that 2012 paper of you know how how to get accountability right for the privacy management uh, program is still so relied upon and so um, uh, so respected even even a you know a solid decade later. So when we're get, just having these discussions about you know operationalizing privacy, it's kind of I, I'm always slightly stunned that you know we're having the discussions about how to do it because we've had a manual out for, for a solid decade now. Um, and, you know, just from, from my experience at, at regulators, like this, that's, if something goes wrong, that's the first thing that always gets, gets asked for. It's like, show me your actual privacy management, show me your privacy management program. Um, and quite frankly, like, quite often th those are, you know, some of the main failings that are found in like breach investigations, you know, we've seen, um, uh, we've seen issues like um, security, security safeguards kind of being passed verbally at, at staff meetings, and that kind of leading to, to significant breaches, because again, you don't have a program established, so therefore you can't revise it, you can't see how effective it is, you can't, you can't measure it, you can't really audit it. Um, and again, you just have this, this, these major issues that, that come up simply because of that lack of, of privacy management programs. So I guess, again, I'm, I'm torn on saying whether or not that's the most, it's, it's a pivotal moment in the, past, in the past decade. It certainly should have been a pivotal moment in the past decade, um, but I'm kind of curious to hear from some, some of the uh, people who have more experience within organizations of you know, how much is that actually the case? How much of an impact did that guidance actually have? Excellent. Why don't we go to Constantine since he's seen, uh, he's seen organizations on both sides of the border and probably beyond. Um, what are your views, Constantine? Well, you know, um, over the last decade, you know, and again, looking, contrasting, you know, developments in Europe as well as in the U.S., I guess what I when when you ask me what's the state of privacy in Canada over the last say ten years, I would say complacency in with tinged with increasing amounts of fear and loathing, and the complacency because we did so well really early on, we got the pat on the back from the Europeans, we got adequacy, and then lot of nothing has happened. Now, of course, provinces passed laws. Um, so that did move the, uh, I think, the um, things forward. But, you know, too many companies still have today a privacy policy on their website, and that's their only privacy policy. And it regurgitates the 10 principles of PEPIDA. Regurgitating the law is not a statement that actually helps people understand what it is you're doing with data. So what else is the problem? I see a lot of people who are typically general counsel, but they might be CIOs or CISOs on whom the organization has decided you're in charge of privacy. And they know that they don't have enough background and experience. They've been had something, you know, another 10 or 15% added to already a 150% job. And they know that they're not able to deal with um, what's really required. So it's com com not complacency so much as just hoping that nothing bad happens, which is to Vance's point about what happens when you finally start getting attention. And that's, you know, sort of like always been whenever you have an incident, you know, bad news, you've had a breach, good news, you've had a breach, because now you're going to actually focus on building the program because now you have no choice. But why does it always come to that, right? So I, I do feel that there's still a lot of room for Canadian companies to improve. And I think also the runway for them to actually do that is getting shorter and shorter, which is what's leading to the fear and loathing. And, and, and I'll- And, and, to, and to your point, Constantine, um, the, the, going back to the breach, right? Uh, we've had this mandate. There's different provincial legislation in different sectors. They've had the mandate of breach. How many companies we go in and they go, oh, well, security records incidents. 
Well, yeah. where's your breach log? Where is your data incident breach register? And they don't know what we're talking about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So There's... what? Sorry. I was just going to say, so Amalia, since um, since you piped up, uh, you're now on the spot. Uh, tell us about those those pivotal moments. Well, I mean, the, to me, that was, um, you know, to, to Vance's point, we had a manual for 10 years. Um, and I'm not sure <laughs> if, if it was written with invisible ink or where the company is at for that. But to, Constantine was saying uh, people post a privacy notice um, that is um, oftentimes incomplete or um, let gives you kind of pause to, to realize the, the kinds of gaps that this company might have and they, they publicly put it on the website. So you realize from that one statement of trust that they put online that they have so many gaps in that one statement that you don't even want to imagine what's happening inside the company. A, a dead giveaway, Amalia, is when they've copied mine and forgotten to actually remove. Yes, yeah, that's, that's that. They didn't even get, uh, give you uh, uh, the-, the uh, No royalties, no royalties. <laughs> royalties are <laughs> some sort of acknowledgement, uh, duly copied from Constantine. It, it counts as attribution when you don't bother to do a replace all. Right? Yeah, I mean, they take it as a compliment. Yes, yes. Uh, it may not be terribly impressive to anybody coming across it. But and just, just really quickly on this privacy notice, because there's been a very interesting conversation on LinkedIn yesterday that people are like, well, it's a privacy policy, it's a privacy notice, it's a duck, it's a, it's, it's a privacy online notice, and it, it is a promise that you make to your customers of how the state of your affairs inside your privacy program. If that promise is poorly written and lopsided um, th that there's no better impression than the first impression but that promise you have on the privacy online notice has to be mirrored inside the company with a privacy program hence our getting accountability right paper and maybe i'll let derek uh <laughs> talk a little bit more about that um Thank you. In, in terms of pivotal moments, uh, I, I have to say the uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, it really woke the public up. And I think uh, that while we've had this manual, uh, you so aptly point to, Vance, uh, I believe that without the motivation, so either enforcement or consumer pressure is what it's going to take for companies to actually take action because companies have so many priorities uh, going on at any given time, adding a, a major one like privacy uh, without a damn good reason uh, is difficult. Uh, so I believe Cambridge Analytica started to wake the, the public up to what is be actually being done with their data. And I, th I think it, it really cracked a whole, um, it, it changed privacy, in my opinion, around the world. Uh, and then obviously GDPR coming in uh, has made a significant impact. Uh, you know, the, you can argue the good and the bad of it, but, uh, but it's, it's a law designed to protect people's data. And I think, um, I think uh, our first effort with Bill C-11, as Vince aptly pointed out with his 60 recommendations uh, for change, um, it, 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 they called it a balanced approach, but that thumb was heavily on the scale in favor of business. Uh, you know, the fact is, uh, our government does not want, uh, to cause any inconvenience to business. And what, what we're not realizing is, uh, we should not have been doing this in the first place. So the changing of the practices, yes, it's inconvenient for businesses, but it's, it's a long overdue cleanup. And um, I believe what's going to make the difference uh, this year is Bill 64 uh, will be enforced. And I believe that that is going to wake an awful lot of companies up and get them in action uh, regarding privacy management programs. Excellent. And, and, and setting the tone, right, Derek? Because yeah. they're setting such a high bar. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, uh, it, it's, it's actually tougher. You know, I've, I've had this conversation several times with both clients and on webinars. It's actually tougher than the GDPR in some aspects 
Mm -hmm. For example, um, on the on the consent front, uh, with GDPR, most business in the EU is done under legitimate interests. And you know, one of the things I noticed is that Quebec left that off. So the only ch two choices you have are contractual mm -hmm. or consent. Yeah. So what's the impact of that? Is that going to drive people back to more what what I call traditional advertising? Because you can't use people's personal data online anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a, it's it's going to be interesting because it, uh, if I were some companies, I would take less risk, use less data, and uh, and go back to more traditional ways of of promoting uh, the brand. It's certainly going to be interesting. <laughs> I yes. definitely agree yes. with you on that. And <laughs> and by and large, there's a sense of uh, based on what you've all said. There's a sense that we've literally been lucky. Businesses in Canada have been lucky over the past decade and a half getting by doing the bare minimum in some cases uh, or perhaps even less. And, mm -hmm. and I certainly find myself talking to companies about the difference in simple terminology. What's the difference between a policy versus a privacy notice? Yes. I, just knowing that simple foundational uh, element can help you better prepare for compliance. And, and certainly one of my big things is uh, when I talk to any kinds of organizations, when we're interviewing them, et cetera, they talk about where can I find a privacy template aside from stealing one from Constantine? Uh, well, if I go online and I Google it and I download it and I, I plaster it to my web page, am I okay then? <laughs> right, And so the idea is always that you want to reflect what you do rather than to just um, just sign your name at the bottom of a templated wish list of of fair information principles. It, so it's that brings almost us like, yeah, Claudio, it's almost like um, uh, you, you, you invert the mirror. You have to start with your privacy program first and then reflect it on the privacy notice on, online. Right. I actually saw an automated version for generating your privacy notices uh, yep. or your, uh, your, your automatic yeah, policy and, generator. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's measured against the laws rather than against the program you have in place. So they, they, their promise to their customers or when the law changes, we'll change your privacy notice. And you're and all good. And it, yeah, and you're all good. It's got nothing to do That's with right. aligning uh, your internal policies with a, a promise, as yeah. you aptly put, Amalia, uh, that uh, this is your promise to the public. This yeah. is how, what we're going to do with your data, and this is what we're not going to do with your data. And, um, and, and what's, that's got nothing to do with the law. And that's got to in. do with your policies. Derek, just to yeah. pick up on that point, sure. recent action by the Competition Bureau, which exerted for the first time ever FTC style jurisdiction in Canada that held you know, um, a company to account for not complying with its own privacy notice. Now that is in my view significant because you know, the notice is a contract as Amalia said with the world. And it's the easiest thing for a regulator to actually look at because you put it out there. And I will say as a lawyer, I caution people in general, whenever somebody asks me for a template, whatever area of law it was, I'm going to go, no, because I don't know what damage you're going to do with it because you don't know how to use it properly. And I would say <laughs> the same is probably true with a lot of privacy programs, which start with here, let's buy a bunch of documents <laughs> or let's steal them from some other company. And then we'll just, you know, do a search and replace. Eh, kind of dangerous. You know, I've come across companies that have said, we are doing this with your data, and they actually, in, in, you know, in, uh, in created or incurred greater responsibility, liability than because they, they weren't actually doing most of that stuff, but they'd copied it. They were a, a process or service provider, and they'd copied it from somebody who actually is acting as a controller or principal, and it was all sorts of stuff they just didn't do. Yeah. So you know, again, you know, there's a little bit. Well, a little bit of you know, ignorance is really dangerous. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way just to steering you clear from potential, um, you know, situations that you don't need to take on. Would you say that it's a lower risk then to copy it from a privacy lawyer, uh, a privacy oh, policy? I would say it's probably even more dangerous. Um, you know, <laughs> 
that's intimidating. Well, you know, and because we, we tend to write, you know, for lawyers, and this is not actually a good thing anymore, right? That whole, like, writing in plain, and that's a requirement of Bill 64, and on Francais, by the way, because let's not forget that you're going to have to be able to communicate clearly and simply in, in both French. language. So, yeah. you know, to move to the current situation, what I view Bill 64 is doing to pick up on Derek's point is basically importing GDPR to Canada. And I've already been supporting clients dealing with clients in Europe. This is going to have big supply chain consequence because, you know, it all feeds down through um, the supply chain, through your business to business relationships. Um, and I don't think Canadian companies, again, have you know, maybe they, they're like, I go back to the fear and loathing thing. They don't want to look at it. So they're just not thinking about it yet. But you've got a, a increasingly short runway, like I said before, to get yourself ready for some of the things that you're actually going to be required by your business partners to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, one of the things I think we kind of need to establish is that uh, the perception that uh, because this is a Quebec law, that you have to have offices in Quebec in order for this law to apply. And I, I, I think that what people have to understand is that 22.5% of the population in Canada is based in Quebec. And the, so the chances are, if you're, if you're holding a national database of any kind, chances are 20 to 25% of your list is Quebec citizens. Therefore, Bill 64 applies. And if you have any, and I think I think that point, I think yeah. that point really needs to be underlined. This is a law that's going to change the privacy landscape in Canada, not just Quebec. And if your business customers have the same sort of proportions, if you're again a service provider doing any kind of services, you know, as a processor, as we like to say, you're going to have that passed down to you. So it's, it's inevitable you're going to be having to contend with these issues at a certain point. So yes. let's let me just shift gears right now and say privacy has been mostly a paper exercise. It's been perceived as legislation that has no teeth uh, in Canada. Um, uh, organizations have basically said, well, yeah, we might accidentally detect things, but if we don't tell anyone, then um, does that mean we are not accountable or will we be okay if we sweep these things under the rug? So by and large, uh, that may or may not have worked over the past couple of decades. So what I'd like to do is, is go around and see what is working in Canada, what companies are doing things right, what organizations are doing things so right that it's improving their credibility and uh, what's, what can organizations do to get to the point where they are verifiably compliant and that will benefit various operational aspects of their, um, uh, of their organization and their supply chain as well. Vance, what do you think? Um, this is always a tricky one for me because again, just being, being employed by who I am, I, I can't really, I do, or can't really highlight who's doing who's doing things well. Oh, we don't need you to However, name names. Well, we healthcare do, yeah. does. Healthcare does in Ontario. <laughs> no comment. Um, <laughs> so, but I, guess, I guess what I'll say, uh, you know, when we're talking about current state and kind of who's who's doing what, I think, you know, the 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 important thing I think we're seeing. So, I, I'm going to frame this slightly differently but just because you know obviously as, as a regulator we see a biased sample of uh, of practices um, so you know what tends to come to our attention are when things hit me when things hit the media which is generally not good practices as well as you know if complaints have been filed again not necessarily good practices so we tend to be seeing more of the bad practice than the actual good practice going forward uh, of what's happening that said what i think you know what's what's encouraging right now is um i think there is a lot more recognition from from organizations of a the uh, first the importance of of privacy so i, I again i do think we're, we're shifting towards um 
people not wanting to shift or to push things under, under the rug again, as, as Derek's saying, after Cambridge Analytica, you're starting to realize that, that people care. I mean, again, Facebook has lost billions of dollars because of, you know, potential changes that Apple's making as far as privacy goes. So, you know, there, there are financial impacts to um, doing things poorly or, or doing things that, that in, in ways that aren't expected. And, you know, that's kind of leading to um, the nice thing of, of organizations that when they're engaging with, with regulators, um, they tend not to be asking for the basics anymore. Um, so it's just kind of, it's nice that we've kind of, I mean, it's been 20 years, but it's nice that when people are doing, you know, coming to us, asking questions, asking for consultations, it's not, you know, we've never heard of privacy before, please help us. It's more kind of like, you know, we've, we've gone through all your decisions. We've got, we've gone through the guidance that's, that's put, that's been put out there. You haven't made a decision yet on the, on this new type of technology, new te type of technology. And we can't quite figure out how to have a lot works. So. You know, I think that's that's you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the good practice that that I want to see even right now is the fact that you know people are doing their homework and then coming out and asking those kind of more nuanced questions. It's not just about you know what are the what are the ten principles anymore. It's it's okay. I don't get this, um, which you know it's it's actually very encouraging. For as, as, as a regulator to, to be getting those questions because it means people are thinking about it. It means people, it means, you know, you're taking obligations seriously and, you know, it's just not necessarily clear what, what has to happen. So um, yeah, that's a long and winding answer to, to kind of saying um, people are asking questions. People are asking, people are starting to ask the right questions, um, which I guess is, you know, where I think we're at currently. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think from just from from uh, perusing Derek's uh, newsfeed, for example, <clears throat> and he's always sharing interesting tidbits on LinkedIn. Uh, Derek, um, what do you see from the private sector perspective, uh, either at either level? Do you see certain practices that can really benefit organizations to uh, bridge the gap between just barely complying to benefiting their organization. So I'm, I'm obviously speaking to you because you've got that, the marketer's hat from an advertising background, et cetera. Do you still see that some organizations in Canada are starting to get the idea that they can, their business can grow as a result of doing the right thing and, and demonstrating respect for personal information? I think it's a great question because I think that that Castle really uh, we're, we're what now 2014 so we're seven eight years out uh, enforcing Castle um, you know you can you can have a comment on how well it's been enforced but uh, the fact is it's been the law and the companies who reacted in the first three years uh, actually saw better results from their marketing they stopped kidding themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the biggest thing for me is the 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 hard stance Castle took on consent uh, in order to send email, and it it kind of marries with the hard stance that Quebec has taken on Bill sixty four, where consent's required. The fact is, though, we don't have the processes in place to to actually keep track and, and record all of these consents. Uh, you know, we, we've partnered with a with a group in the UK uh, that have a brilliant uh, uh, preference management center that your consumers can just go in and tell you what's okay with them. And mm -hmm. then that that plugs into everywhere you're using data in your system and and it just operates in the background and you can always prove consent. I don't know how companies are going to uh, prove consent because I yeah. I actually think if I walked into. 98% of the companies in Canada and said, uh, g give me, uh, show me your consent for these 20 people. Uh, I'll, I'll bet very few of them could actually prove consent. And right. I, and I think that's, that's gotta be one of the biggest deals going forward is your ability to uh, the, the ROPA, the, the records of processing activity, uh, 
that are going to be required to prove that you're doing what the law is asking you to do. Now, keep in mind, the law is the low bar. Yeah. Really, what we it's should a baseline be baseline requirement. Yeah, yeah, what we should be looking at is, is would this be okay with our customer? Yeah. Like, um, and then that brings up a, an excellent point. I wanted to go to to Constantine. Constantine, it's it's 2022. Uh, do a lot of Canadian companies still have a false sense of privacy? I think they do. I think that it's changing because the rest of the world is educating us. Like you mentioned, you know, or I think I can't remember who mentioned it that you know fines haven't been a significant driver. Um, not being able to get revenue, not being able to close contract is a driver that management understands. And so increasingly there's two factors. Um, Cambridge Analytica, but along with GDPR, really altered consumer expectations around privacy. Um, we, as privacy professionals, couldn't have successfully spammed the planet as effectively as every company did in 2018 when they said, <laughs> can we can have your consent to continue writing to you? And everybody went, <laughs> privacy? What's that? And then all of a That's sudden- That's how they understood GDPR. Yeah. Well, they, they understood something. And one of the consequences I know from talking with privacy officers in Canada is that access requests started going up. Because We always had those rights, but now people have been educated about it in a way. I mean, there have been negative things that have happened that reinforced it, but also that there was this mass education by spam, ironically, for us that took place. The other side is that businesses in Europe and in the United States are presenting demands via contracts through data protection addenda saying you must do these things. And suddenly, you know, again, you know, the threat of fines has never been a motivator for it seems management to get, you know, to resource that poor general counsel or, you know, privacy officer within the organization. But now suddenly when they go, oh, we can't actually do this, and they want audits, they want assessments, and now suddenly we actually, you know, to the point I think everyone is making, you actually have to prove you're doing what you say you're doing. And therein lies the rub, right? Evidence. The Canadians have not, you know, like implemented the right systems in general to be able to be Ironically, the accountability, accountability part is demonstrability, right? You need to be able to prove you're doing what you say you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Love it. Uh, Amalia, your thoughts? Well, I, I think I, I want to pick up on what Derek said and what Constantine said. We're going, we're going back to um, accountability. <laughs> So it's no longer about, <laughs> I mean, the, the manual was written 10 years ago. Um, well, there's a lot of interesting things that Vance pointed out, and I, it didn't occur to me, but we as Canadians, when we speak to our customers, we actually use the, the highest uh, law bar possible, even in terminology. We talk about um, controllers and processors. So we're we're basically educating the public and the companies that this is their role. It doesn't matter that the law hasn't been updated in some time or no, these are the requirements now today in 2022. Um, so um, I think we also have to keep in mind um, that a lot of companies are new. There's for, for me, this is something I have to keep reminding myself. There are new companies that are um, just setting up, they're very ambitious. They want to go, go from small business to medium size very fast. They're so focused on business, but they've never heard about privacy, privacy requirements. Um, so I think the more we educate, the more we share best practices, the more we say it, um, that is going to that is going to help the Canadian market to realize. This is not just like a trend into 2022. This is something we actually have to get on that train and start learning the terminology, start learning what it means to have a privacy management program, learn what it means to have a, recognize a breach, declare a breach and put a process around it, learn to do a PIA <laughs> and learn to follow the data to see where it flows out of Quebec or whatever province and what safeguards are on them. 
this is going to be terminology that is going to become de facto. Okay. So it sounds like, <clears throat> at least to me, it sounds like we're at a bit on, of an inflection point in the development of privacy in Canada. So as we're leaning towards more stringent requirements, as we're all apparently welcoming more uh, direct, more effective privacy legislation and regulations, uh, what should businesses take away in general from those trends and specifically from our event today? What should they walk away with, starting with policies, of course, but really if they go back and they do a lot of thinking, uh, what are the first few steps that they need to go through to, to be able to start to get it right? Mr. Constantine. Okay. So getting accountability right is a good starting point, ironically. Um, but also thinking about who your audience is. If you're a business and you, again, I, I tend to you know work with a lot of service providers and they tend to use, maybe your clients use NIST or ISO or want to stock two, then that's a basis for a framework. Because remember, picking a framework should communicate effectively what your controls are and that they're effective. And so uh, starting with the framework, because you know, I often say to my clients at the beginning of any project around developing a program, you know, it looks intimidating when you try to think about you know, eating an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So <laughs> take it apart, put it into a framework, look at the individual activities, prioritize, because you're not going to do everything at once. That's what makes people, again, go into the fear and loathing mode. They just see this massive project in front of them. You got to break it down. And again, focus on things. If you are a retailer and you're primarily on the web, you want to look at your notice. You want to you know, figure out how you're going to be managing consent. That's kind of like the priority. If you're a service provider, those aren't the things you may need to focus on. But point being, you've got to map this to your business. This is why the template approach doesn't work. You'll often be dragged down directions you probably don't need to or may not need to do for a while. So again, it's really important to break it down, focus on what the elements are that support you doing the right thing in your business, given the nature of the data that you're managing. And also, again, keeping in mind who your audiences are. Your audiences are consumers, they're business clients, they're the regulator. And think about how you wanna communicate uh, convincingly that you're doing the right thing, or at least you're on the path. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and Constantine, the framework is such a great point that you're making, and this is actually what we're teaching right now in our course, but we're talking about frameworks because um, eating that elephant is difficult, but you also communicate to your entire company how to eat that elephant. It is a, a unified language that you speak with everyone. It's a unified language for risk as well. So then you can get have allies and IT starts to understand what you're saying and InfoSec starts to understand what you're saying and other people start to understand because you're speaking from the same language of, of, of repository. Sure. Establishing a common language is, is certainly a key to to success in security. Um, and, and of course, it's taken a lot for Canadian businesses to understand some of that. What I've noticed, um, again, from a cybersecurity standpoint, is that the public, uh, in the case of within the context of privacy, data subjects take their cue from service providers from companies so they almost trust them until they're given a chance not to trust them mm -hmm. they see them as 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 the expert so if you go to a website and you're a regular person you take your cue from the way these people come across and you just assume that they know more about privacy than you do and you just assume that they're going to take care of you unless you you do something to uh, to erode that trust. So in some cases, that trust has been misplaced. Um, as some of you have said, there have been pivotal moments in the past decade that have um, caused some of that trust to falter, but also caused 
the public to increase their awareness and vigilance about who they're sharing personal information with. So um, what are some of the tips that you've got? Let's say, Derek, uh, what are a couple of tips that organizations can, can, can do right now? And then we'll go to Vance. Uh, uh, I love it. Uh, so if you look at the way Quebec laid out their coming into force, it's brilliant because it allows or corporations and organizations to, to eat the elephant one bite at a time. They said this September, uh, the CEO being accountable, the highest authority in the company being accountable is coming into force and the breach notification, or they call it confidentiality incident uh, reporting. Uh, that whole planning, uh, including a registry has to be in place this September. So they're saying, here are your first two bites. Uh, so, so any organization that waits until December to start worrying about it, it's too late. You could get fined for not having your, your confidentiality incident reporting planning in place. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure, given that they made these two things the first uh, coming into force, I'm pretty sure you're going to see some pretty rich fines to direct CEOs coming out of the gate out of Quebec. And it's because they want to, they want to actually underline that accountability and that it, the accountability lies with the highest authority in the organization. They put that in the law intentionally. And I think, uh, uh, I, I think that we just have to start paying attention and start leaning in and just one piece at a time, start to put a, good practices in place and um and and, and i i i think uh as constantine said uh eating an elephant one bite at a time start taking bites <laughs> vance what are your thoughts i think for me I'm, I'm i'm kind of repeating some of constantine's point of um figure out what you are measuring against so <clears throat> Being in being in regulator's office, I can I can tell you, you know, if somebody's if somebody kind of says, you know, prove that you have the appropriate security practices, and you can say, okay, well, here's how we certify against ISO, here's how we certify against SOC, uh, SOC two, like that's that's incredibly powerful for for us. Um, you know, those those are the kinds of things that we're that we're looking at. So again, ide identifying. Whether it's guidance from guidance from the regulators of how to um, how to actually meet the meet your criteria or industry guidance or, or certifications, um, working through okay how how can I prove how can I best essentially prove prove my compliance because again this is something that that you'll see in emerging legislations so it's almost certainly going to be in C11 replacement if Ontario ever moves forward with something it'll be in there where you're getting um, more promotion of things like codes of conduct, codes of practice. Um, you know, European Data Protection Board just issued its first um, advice on on um, uh, certification criteria for things like a data protection seal. So, like to me, these those are the kinds of things that we're that we're really looking for. Is are those defined frameworks of how to um, of of how to evaluate compliance? Because you know, it's it's hard for it's hard for regulators even to, to look at a, to, to go through a, an unstructured, you know, uh, privacy program and say, and, and make a determination of, of whether it's compliant or not. So yeah, look, look at those. And again, get to get, you know, as, as those kind of things get introduced into law, maybe start having discussions within your industries of, of if there isn't a, a code of conduct or if there isn't, you know, a standardized way of compliance, Maybe you can start developing one. Maybe you can start, you know, kind of coming together to fit to, you know, work through a, a proposal of here's what we think compliance, what we think compliance looks like. Regulators, what do you think about that? Um, there's, there's going to be those kind of opportunities to, um, to develop frameworks. So, yeah, again, the, the bottom line is just figure out um, how you're going to prove compliance and ideally prove it against a known standard. Brilliant. I, I love the point about having discussions within your own industry because there's so much siloing that I'm seeing where people just see competition 
everywhere. And so they bring up their walls and their defenses and they say, you know what, we'll ask, we'll ask our, our advisors to tell us what those guys are doing instead of just simply reaching out and creating a, a working group or some kind of a regular uh, opportunity to share information. So I'm hearing you all saying that education, enforcement, um, focus, um, and of course, these open discussions are ways to move forward. Amalia, what are some of your tips from your uh, vantage point? Um, it's always nice to be last because you hear everything, whatever one says, and you get so That's inspired. Right. You, you can oh, copy. You can copy. I don't want to copy, but I want to say I'm very inspired constantly. I'm not. I'm not copying. Um, I, I want to say, and it's been said, but I want to say it loud, prove it. That's what the next accountability 2.0 is, prove it. It's not going to be enough to just have the right intention. And this is why, folks, we have huge advocacy groups out there, like uh, SRAMS, none of your business, uh, Electronic uh, Frontier. Yeah, yeah, Frontier. Uh, there's uh, so many advocacy groups out there. I mean, why is Google in court in, in California? Because they were, uh, Google was tracking, even though you put yourself in incognito mode in Chrome. It's because of these advocacy groups. Why do we know about Google Analytics and Google Fonts? Because of these advocacy groups. So everything is out in the open. You can't, you can't hide behind good intentions anymore. You got to prove it. Excellent. Fantastic. So, and, and if I could just quickly build on, oh, build please. on that. Yeah, I by all means. The, the other yeah. thing, it's, it's not just about advocacy groups. The government would desperately love to promote innovation. The, the government desperately wants to create a legislative framework that allows for um, additional sharing of data within, within certain privacy frameworks. So, you know, where, where um, you know, if, if we're stepping back on, on consent or something like that, there's going to be, you know, there's going to have to be something that fills in, this, fills in the gap and accountability is going to be that piece. Mm -hmm. So again, the stronger, the, the stronger industry accountability practices can be, the more comfort the government can have kind of advancing a, a, a legislation along those lines that kind of says, you know, we, we, can, we can base a lot, of, a lot of data sharing on, you know, truly demonstrable accountability. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's not just about avoiding the negatives. It's, it's about finding new ways to, to be able to use data. Absolutely. Um, I think we're going to leave it here. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, as everyone can see, uh, our august set of panelists um, is or are full of anecdotes. Their knowledge and their wisdom well, runs deep. Something. So by all or means, <laughs> oh, please, <laughs> or something, uh, or please something. do do follow them on LinkedIn or elsewhere, uh, perhaps not in real life, because that would be stalking, but, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, on social media, I think is fair, especially and, given the pandemic, you want to keep yeah. your distance. And yeah. we have more of these events coming, folks, so yeah. if yep, you want to know more about absolutely. privacy. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, no, um, we'll, we'll be posting this particular event, we'll, we're going to extract some key sound bites from our panelists and by all means share some of the next events as you see them coming across your newsfeed. The next one will be March 10th and after that will be on March 30th. We're going to have at least a couple of these per month on very important topics and I again I want to uh, I want to thank our panelists here for for today. It's certainly been insightful. It's been great for me and I hope every one of you has got uh, uh, value from spending the time with us today. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us for lunch. It was a nice lunch. That's right. <laughs> I hope it was a nice lunch. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.